You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. Brand new studio installed here at the Nine Foot Homemade Oak Bar. Uh, right now, it's just a mess of wires and this big, giant operating system that was custom made by Sweetwater out in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and shipped here. And uh, the processing power is supposed to be like, you know, 10 times stronger than what we already had. And I got all the bells and whistles, and I got this beautiful new monitor, and I've got, I don't even know how half the stuff works. And after five hours, of crying and begging and praying to God above, somehow, some way, we were able to put together a sax in the basement. And, and hopefully, in post-production, I don't sound like Mickey Mouse. But right now, I believe that it's working as we're sitting here and we're recording, my friend. And I, as the new artificial intelligence in your new system, Christopher, <laughs> am happy to have replaced Ed. I'm telling you, man, it has been it has been a, a stressful thing. There's a lot more build to do here. When it's all said and done, it's going to just be... The coolest setup. It's what I always envisioned when I started doing podcasting, like professionally, when I built this studio almost six years ago, and I couldn't afford this setup, right? But now with all the shows that are out there, like Southside Pod, the EP Podcast, Socks in the Basement, of course, and and the many others that are produced on the Broadcast Basement On Demand Radio Network, I was finally able to say, you know what? Let's get what we should have gotten in the first place. And instead of running it off a laptop... Uh, whose battery can just simply explode and then melt everything away inside of it like some sort of horror movie. Uh, Now I have this really neat little thing, and there's backup systems now. Like, I I will never have this problem again. There is a backup hooked into the actual system. If something goes wrong, we we will not stop again. So I'm very, very excited about that. So, you know, it's learning from your mistakes, which I wonder, is that what Jerry Reinstorf is doing when he's looking at a new ballpark and a new location here at the tail end of his life is the quote that we saw within the last six months or so. Remember when he was talking about being a billionaire and he was like, you know, I don't have anything else to do. So I'm just going to be the, you know, run the white Sox until I'm dead. And, and, and this is, this is what, I, what I enjoy doing. And I want to leave some sort of legacy and I want to, I want to make it better before I, I go. Is, is this what he's doing? And, and is this ballpark going to be named Jerry Reinstorf field? Because I think that's what it's going to be. This isn't just a new ballpark on a very rich parcel of land. My friend, I guarantee you, this is like Ted Turner when he had Turner field, this is going to be Reinstorf field. He isn't getting a statue. He's getting a ballpark. Well, and then as soon as his family sells the team to Jeff Bezos and it becomes Amazon.com field, you know, all of that legacy will be washed away. No, but- it'll be Jerry Reinstorf field at Amazon.com stadium. Like, it'll be, it'll be one of those weird things where he'll have it written in there that he gets to keep the name for like 100 years. You you watch him do that. I mean, look, old billionaires want to be remembered. They they want And they want to stick it to their critics. That whole thing going down to Nashville and all that stuff that was just your classic Jerry Reinstorf posturing to get a conversation started. He always wanted to move out of Comiskey Park, right? He always wanted to leave. From the moment he got in there, he's like, I want to get rid of this place. And then he kind of basically was just able to move across the street and he kept 35th and Shields and all the nostalgia for the fans. But deep down, he doesn't want to be there. He doesn't want his ballpark to be there. His, his big achievement at the end would be to actually get them at this parcel of land. What, what do they call this? Like the, the 78 The block? 78. The 78, yeah. right. I don't know if it's the richest land that's available, but it's the biggest, one of the biggest parcels you're going to find in the city itself that, that doesn't put you out in the suburbs. I, you know, it, it's where the Bears, you know, if the Bears wanted it, they probably could have tried to make a play for it themselves, but they went and bought Arlington Park to go out to Arlington Heights. It might not be big enough for the Bears. They, you know, I mean, a ballpark... Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, the ballpark for a baseball team is, is smaller than what you need for a football stadium. That's true. Yeah, baseball stadiums it can be put in a, in a smaller smaller area. And then the idea is they have, like, shops and bars and whatever. Who knows if it'll actually happen, right? Well, I, I, I think it I think it's got a chance. Yeah, but you know what? There's also a much greater chance that like in 10 years, you're still sitting at 33rd and Princeton in the shadow of the ballpark at Cork and Carey at the park. 
You know, you're still getting your two for one award winning burger. Uh, maybe you'll be talking about how 10 years previously you went to Hawaii on Cork and Carry and Kona Beer. Once again, get into Cork and Carry on Western Avenue or at Cork and Carry at the park at 33rd and Princeton in the shadow of the ballpark, the official home of White Sox pregame, postgame, in game, and also of Sox in the basement. And it's no purchase necessary. Register for a trip to Hawaii. Drawing is coming up on March the 15th. Get in there and do it. And while you're in there, you can get a $5 Kona beer as well, right on tap. But I would say if you had to bet, I would say at this moment, probably staying exactly where he is. You know, this could be a Reinstorf tactic to eventually just get what he envisions, right? You know, like uh, threatening to go to Tampa Bay, but then really getting the stadium and getting it all public funded. You know, you don't know what he's doing. Like, this could be the art of negotiation. Go shoot for the stars on this parcel of land and then eventually fall back to the thing that he just really wants, which is extending his lease and having the same sweetheart deal that he currently has. So it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. It's kind of fun to imagine a Chicago skyline like that you're looking out towards like a really cool view or something in the ballpark. The idea of getting maybe a classic stadium again, you know, getting something that's similar to the original Comiskey Park where, you know, where you're right up there on the field. Like I look at that parcel of land, I think to myself, that's a small little area. You probably have to build a stadium where the fans are kind of more on top of the field. And that's separated and way off in the distance and in an upper deck that's like you're actually getting a nosebleed while you're up there and you need a Sherpa to get you to the last 10 rows. There's some renderings that that disappeared and reappeared and, and they've been on a Sox Reddit page. They show the park, they show a park, not the park, but they show a park, which is kind of pointed the wrong direction because it doesn't have them hitting out into the river, which is what they really should be doing, right? Because this this area is it's basically Clark and Roosevelt with the river on one side of it. Right, and that's what I want. I want baseballs hit into the dirty river and then watching people dive into that river. And never come out. <laughs> they can actually have a board up. The, the river has claimed this many people this right. season. Yeah, how, many, how many fans have we lost to the river this to week? To the but, river trying to get a ball. I mean, it's not um, going to be it's not going to be the same as sitting in San Francisco Bay in your kayak, right? Nope. Like, it's no, not, no. It's not going to be no. like that. No. No. No, but it's an extra run if you hit a Wendella boat. But I, I, I mean, I'm looking at it, and you're right. You know, on one hand, it's a chance to, just in general, it's a chance to give us a better fan experience and a better stadium. But I think, you know, knowing Jerry Reinsdorf as he is, and I, and I think you do look to the Bears as kind of a parallel here. I don't know that the Bears are leaving Soldier Field anytime soon either, but Virginia McCaskey is going to pass on before too long here. The woman is very, very old, and the McCaskey family may not hold on to the team after she's gone. But they are worth a heck of a lot more if they own real estate that could become a stadium. And I think Jerry's in kind of the same boat. He is up there in age, and the Reinstor family may not stick around as Chicago sports owners once he's gone, once Jerry goes, they may want to sell and they are worth more. The team is worth more if they have a plot of real estate that could be developed into a stadium. So I think this is the old real estate attorney, the old real estate land baron guy, Jerry Reinsdorf. That's how he made his money before he bought the team. I think this is him doing that as a way to increase the value of the White Sox franchise and as a way to, yes, you're right, potentially build a legacy and and kind of correct a mistake that he made with the current ballpark where it's not a terrible place to watch a game, but it could have been so much better. I mean, there's a lot of things that are going to change in White Sox and Major League Baseball in the city of Chicago by the time that would happen where the team moves to the South Loop and the 78 is developed into Jerry Reinsdorf Field at Reinsdorf Stadium with the Reinsdorf group of restaurants and hotels and <laughs> Reinsdorf land, the theme park. Listen, here's the only thing I'm concerned about. The only thing I'm worried about with the stadium, the first thing that popped into my head was, you're talking about moving from 35th and Shields. What happens to all the bricks that everybody bought after they won the World Series? Are you moving the memorial? Is that because you're better? Ooh, yeah. You, you told all those people that if they bought those bricks and spent all that money and got their names in the memorial, it was going to be there forever. And you know what? It, there's going to be a lot of them still alive when you when you decide you want to move if you do something like this to another spot. That's the question right there. And I have immediately triggered every season ticket holder over the age of 60 to call their ticket <laughs> agent. Yes, you have. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people uh, that just flop the sweat. 
sweat started pouring out of him. Socks in the Basement listeners, if you're looking for exterior windows, doors, patio doors, or storm doors, there's only one place to look. Window and Door Superstore of Oak Forest. They are not looking for a new stadium. They have been in Oak Forest since 1985. They're, they're staying there. All right. They're right there on 159th, just a half block east of Ridgeland. You get over there. You check out their showroom. Full examples, glass designs on display, no pictures in a book. You see everything in person. You speak to an owner in the showroom. There's one on site. All window and door superstore installers. They don't farm out the work. It may be freezing outside now, but now is the time to start thinking about those upgrades you're going to be making in the spring and summertime. All major brands custom made with no stock items for a perfect fit. As I said, a half block east of 159th and Ridgeland at 6280 159th Street. See more at window door oak forest.com and the orioles are incredibly stingy from what i can see here and i love the fact that chris gets is basically saying i'm not giving away this incredible asset a pitcher that that was very close to winning a cy young just two seasons ago that you could explain the little bit of a downturn that he had last year because of how bad the team was around him and in those last couple of months He didn't look very motivated out there, but it has the goods that teams want. And if you're looking for a guy that's going to make $8 million this year and probably only a couple million more than that the next year in arbitration and two years of control, and all you got to do is give up some prospects from a very deep prospect system. If I'm Chris Getz, I've got my, my guys that I want. You're going to give me what I want, one of these three packages that I proposed to you, or Dylan Cease is going to be starting opening day for the White Sox. And I I get the idea that he could lose value, Ed. I get the idea he could come out of the gate and he could fall flat on his face. But I don't think he falls flat on his face with the defense that's been put behind him. I don't think the White Sox think that he's going to have as bad of a season. They're betting on themselves. And I think we we get ourselves trapped from time to time in this idea of like, okay, well, this is the smart move. This is a, like, you know, the odds are that we do this. It, but, but you have a general manager who's confident, rightly or wrongly so, confident in what he's building that he believes Dylan Cease is going to be in a better position to perform this year, and he's not just going to give him away. Well, and that's the thing. Everybody just assumes that this is going to be – Johan Mankata, okay? This is going to be that, right? Where where his high point was a couple of years ago. He's still got a couple of years of team control. Uh, the, the, you know, the performance on the field gets progressively worse and he loses his value. Or that, you know, you run the risk of an injury or something like that. Hey, those, are, those are all valid concerns, of course. But, but I think really what it is, is is who's going to blink first, right? If the Yankees get Blake Snell, are the Orioles going to sit there and go, all right, fine, fine. You know, we'll do it. We'll go. You know, are they going to be, you know, they're, they're, they're Cameron and Ferris Bueller's day off. So the car. I'll go, I'll go. Getz will keep calling. He'll keep calling and, and I'll go, you know, and then they start the car and then they throw the keys out the window. Or are they going to sit there and go, look, we're just, we're, we're just not going to do this. We want Jordan Westberg too much, right? We, we don't want to give up too many prospects. Uh, we'll wait and see how we do. And we'll bet on ourselves that we'll be able to compete with the guys that we have and it's not, you know, necessarily something where they have to keep up with everybody else. I, I don't know. If I'm Chris Getz, I think betting on the White Sox being better, betting on better infield defense, better motivation behind him, okay, because everybody on this team has something to prove. I think that's the one thing that we're kind of forgetting in all of this. When you're, when you're signing a bunch of guys who are cast-offs and, and, you know, guys that were not really guaranteed to be on – on anything, Eric Fetty's got a lot to prove. Even though he won the MVP in the KBO last year, he's got a lot to prove that he can be a major league player. Chris Flexen has got to prove that he's a major league pitcher again. I don't know if he's right? going to be able to do that. Well, I'm not. I'm not. I don't want to get into like who is going to be something or not be something. The point is, is that go around the horn. Tell me who doesn't have something to prove right now, in, in any way, shape, or form. Who's walking into this season feeling safe? Right, Luis Robert Jr. Yeah, well, and honestly, I, I disagree with you on that one because I think he's got to prove that he's he's the superstar that everybody says he is, and, and I think he is, and I think there's another gear that he would like to take his game to, but Ben Benintendi's got to prove that he's worth his contract. Whoever ends up in right field is going to have to prove something. Nicky Lopez is trying to prove that he's a vi- viable Major League starting infielder. Paul DeYoung's trying to prove that. Yohan Moncada's is playing for his next contract. Uh, Andrew Vaughn, I think, is playing for for basically his job. 
Aloy Jimenez is playing for his job. Martin Maldonado is probably the safest guy on the team, right? Because he's he's one of the few guarantees, and he's at the end of his career anyway. All he has to do is continue being a, a good pitch framer, having good pop times behind the plate, and handling the pitching. Yeah, staff but he well. he started to fall off in, in a lot of areas last year, so he's got something to prove because he's trying to prove that he can still do it, and he doesn't want to go out poorly. You're right. I think everybody on the team has something to prove. I think. But last year that wasn't the case. Tell me, Tim Anderson thought he had something to prove. No, he thought he he thought he was a superstar, and he's still not signed by anybody. I mean, I, I was thinking about that the other day. Like, he's still not signed by anybody, and we we are now half. We're halfway through January. We're we're closer to February first than January first at this point. We're we're getting very close to pitchers and catchers. He doesn't have a place anymore. I wonder if Chris Getz has reached out at this point and said, "Hey, we would take you as a second baseman." They might have reached out to him and said, "Hey, come out here and try out as an outfielder. See if he, see if he can be Fernando Tatis. See if he can have a second career as an outfielder." I can't believe that they wouldn't talk to him about other options. I just don't think that they want him to be their shortstop. I just don't think that that's something that they that if you listen to what their model is, I don't think that's what they want. I also think one thing that's really kind of stuck out to me with this whole thing with Getz holding up the Orioles and anybody else that wants Dylan Cease for what he wants. I think it speaks to his belief. I mean, I don't know. I don't know the man. And I haven't talked to him. But it speaks to his belief in my mind that he's do- going to have a quick turnaround. That if you don't want Dylan Cease, and he never gets the deal he wants for the value he thinks he's worth, and Dylan Cease is, is actually starting on this team in 2025, that Chris Getz believes he's going to have a team ready for 2025 that could go to the postseason. Oh, yeah. Like him saying, I don't need to get rid of him because I could just have him play out his contract. And then I would at least have a guy in 2025 that's that's in my he needs a lot of pieces to be competitive. If he really wants the quick turnaround, which seems to be if you're if you're listening to what he's saying, if you're if you're watching the moves that they're making, if you're I think that there is a there's a push to to get back to being competitive quickly. Dylan Cease could be part of that competitive team. I don't know if that's a very good idea, but if he believes it, if he believes that his team is going to be competitive by 25 and nobody's going to give him what what Dylan Cease is worth, then he's just not going to give him away for free because he's not going into a long-term rebuild. You see, that's the thing. I, I think whenever I see an argument from somebody of like, well, you have to make this move. Trust me, I think that making the move before the season start is probably going to give them the most optimal return. But they can't force somebody to trade with them. So when you see people going, well, you just got to take whatever they're given. Like you just got to just got to make a move. You just got to move on from them. You just got to get what you can because you're going to get even worse in midseason. I think that's loser talk. I think that's like saying like, well, I, I just believe that we're going to suck for five years. Like this is, it, it's back at the beginning of the last so-called rebuild again. And we're going to sit here and be terrible for years and years. Like we're, we're a three, four year program. I don't think that's what Chris gets his plan is. All right. If that's what his plan is, was, he'd be moving Luis Robert Jr. right now. He doesn't want to do that. He wants, he expects to have him playing in meaningful baseball games for the majority of that four years that's still left of control. So I think he wants the quick turnaround. So if he believes he can get the quick turnaround, whether or not he's right or wrong, then why would he give away Cease for less than what he thinks Cease is worth? Because his worst case scenario is that Cease is pitching in 25 and he's sitting there telling everybody we're going to be competitive and look, I signed this other pitcher in free agency and we found this diamond in the rough and of all the all the guys we ran out there in 24, we found two starters and we think we've got a staff now and we went out and got this free agent. We've got the payroll back up in the top 10. Well, it's probably sitting at 10th or 9th or something like that and we're going to compete. And by the way, Dylan Cease, he's maybe gone at the end of the year, but we're at least going to use him in 25. Well, and there's something to be said about that and sit there and say, okay, you know, if Dylan Cease is at the end of 25, if Dylan Cease is somebody that, you know, Jerry's willing to open up the the books for, okay, and sign the guy because they are in a really big competitive window and he doesn't want to be, you know, vilified, that, you know, there's always chances. There's always opportunities there. And, and yeah, this is not... This is not lining up as a long-term rebuild for exactly the reasons you said. There would be no reason to have kept anybody worth any value on the roster for 2024 because Luis Robert Jr. should have been then leveraged against Juan Soto before Soto was traded to the Yankees, right? There should have been a bidding war. Which one do you want more, guys? Cashman, which one do you want more? Who do you want to give more guys for here? And none of that took place. 
I mean, absolutely none of that took place. So I think you're right. I think he's content to sit there and say, this guy will be the ace of my staff in 2024 and 2025. And I'm willing to roll the dice again, also in a really, really weak division, because tell me that the Minnesota twins have improved this year, this off season. They really have not. The guardians seem to be going backwards a little bit. They're talking about trading their closer. They're talking about trading Shane Bieber. Uh, you know, they're, they're not in a, in a, you know, in a win now mode kind of thing where they're going out and getting expensive free agents. Nobody in the central is, and maybe the tigers a little bit, but I mean, come on, it's the tigers and then it's the Royals. And I know we're supposed to be the Royals North East ish, but I, I really do think that there's, there's probably part of Chris gets at sister and goes, I can put together a ragtag bunch of guys and compete in this division and make the playoffs. And Dylan cease would be an important part of that if I want to keep him. But if you want to give me some pretty sure bets, if you want to give me a guy that's going to anchor my rotation, if you want to give me a guy that's going to be an anchor in my infield, if you want to give me a guy that's going to be a stud or two studs or three studs for for this guy, by all means, load me up because I will absolutely take that, those on. But, yeah, what what would be the point of him going out and getting a bunch of guys for Dylan Cease that are not guarantees at this point, that are not major league ready, that have limited track records, that are are just guys that have high pedigree as prospects. If you weren't going to sit there and say we're developing them for 2026, for 2027, I think they're, I think what he's trying to do is he's trying to find a quick fix and he's trying to use Dylan Cease to fill up a bunch of gaps in his lineup. He doesn't have a right fielder right now. He could probably use somebody to, as a running buddy for Colson Montgomery when he gets here. He doesn't have a long-term plan at third unless you believe in Brian Ramos. And, you know, you could easily replace an Andrew Benintendi somewhere along the line as well. I mean, there's a lot of places to go here with, with talent. And, yeah, you could use Dylan Cease to do that very quickly right now, which is why... You know, I think even some of what he was doing with the Reds was sitting there going, look, I just, I'm just i not going to trade this guy for Jonathan India, but if you're not willing to part with Matt McClain, if you're not willing to part with uh, you know, Ellie De La Cruz or, or one of the premium guys that you plan on running out there this year, then why should, I, you know, why should I bother? I'll just take all of your top prospects. I still think that was posturing on Chris Getz's part, and I really think the reason why the Yankees are out is because he looked at him and went, you don't have anything. And the Braves offered him Vaughn Grissom, and he's like, that's not enough. Because Vaughn Grissom is a nice player, but he he flamed out last year with the Braves. He did not do anything, but he was given a chance. And the same thing with Michael Bush out in L.A., where the Dodgers, I know it's a big thing, oh, well, he could have been on the south side now, he's on the north side. Yeah, but he can't catch a baseball, for one thing. And two, he's also a guy that hasn't proved it in the majors yet, so what are you going to do with him? He's Gavin Sheets. You know, that's what Michael Bush is until further notice. So I like the fact that Chris Getz isn't blinking. And I would be okay with Dylan Cease being on the mound opening day and and having that answered as to who the opening day starter is and knowing that there's at least two guys in the rotation now because we know that it's him and Eric Fetty. And everybody else is, you know, everybody else, you got something to prove. Socks and Basement listeners, here's the deal. When you combine State Farm Home and Auto Insurance, you save an average of $889. State Farm agent John Harrell is ready to help you combine home and auto and save in the Chicagoland area. Give him a call at 708-481-4500 today. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Average annual per household savings based on a 2019 national survey by State Farm of new policyholders who reported savings by switching to State Farm. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Nice. I love it. You you should be throwing that in after every John Harrell State Farm ad. I will then. Like all the time you should be doing that. Well, you have it now. There you go. What player do you think has the most to prove this year for the White Sox? What player do I think has the most to prove this year for the White Sox? Well, I'm not going with Yohan Moncada because he's never going to be able to prove that he deserves the money that's in his option. It's a, it's an insurmountable task, right? No, he he's got to prove to the Grammys that he's worthy of an international. Yeah, yeah, yeah like I that, like that's like low hanging fruit. Like Yohan Moncada needs to prove he's worth that money because he's not going to be able to do he's it. He's not going to do it. No, no. he's not going to be able to do it. Um, no, I mean realistically, who who could prove? Who who has the most to prove that they they are a core part of this team going forward? Andrew Vaughn. Okay, I had to listen all last year about how he's a natural leader. He's he's our Paul Canerco. Right, he's our Paul right? Canerco. Well, guess what? You're not Paul Canerco yet. Okay, I don't know if you'll ever be. Right now, you're Ross Glowed. Right, you're not hitting like him. You're not you're not playing like him. So look, I would say yeah, he's got the most to prove because because I don't know what he is yet. 
But I'm starting to believe that he is what I've been watching the last year or two, and that's all it's going to be. And I don't even know if I blame him completely for it because of how badly he was rushed to the majors, and clearly they did not handle him properly. And, and there was no development. He had to develop at the major league level, and it was, it was all done poorly, right? But, I mean, when I think of a guy like Aloy Jimenez, what's he going to prove to me? That he can stay healthy? Because if he's healthy, he's productive. You know, he's not going to prove to me he can play defense. See, I already know there's certain things he can't prove. So, I mean, you, you know, you could say, oh, aloy has got to prove something. Well, hey, what is he going to prove that I don't already know? Same thing with Moncada. And, you know, Andrew Benintendi may have ticked everybody off with the way that he played in left field last year, but he's he's had a long enough career that I could say, well, he needs to, he needs to revert back to what he was before. He's got he's to have a better season. That's something to prove. But really, I, the bullseye, I think, is on Andrew Vaughn because here's a guy that if I don't see anything different out of him, if I don't see an improvement at the plate out of him, if, if I don't see the guy finally becoming what I was promised he was, which was just this pure natural hitter with this beautiful swing that was just going to be hitting the ball all over the place and out of the ballpark, if I don't, if I don't start seeing that, then I got to start wondering what's the plan for first base after him because I need more production out of first base. And, I, and you can go find it in free agency pretty much every year to replace him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's easily the most replaceable guy in the diamond, right? Yeah. Because anybody, even Aloy Jimenez, Right, even Aloy Jimenez could replace him at first base because you could put a glove on him and just say, "Stand still, just don't don't move." No, he'd right? be a, he'd be a comedy of errors over at first base. Yeah, he would be terrible. But yes, that's that's also something where first basemen are kind of a dime a dozen. Big guys who can hit, who have a little bit of glove in them, uh, but you know maybe aren't the best with the arm, maybe aren't the best moving. You can find production at first base very, very easily. Anytime, anytime in Major League Baseball, you can find a guy that hits 21 home runs over a season, hits 258 with a 743 OPS, and that's Andrew Vaughn last year. And and place him at first base. Yeah, right. I mean, like, I mean, your, really first honestly, baseman, your first baseman should have an OPS over 800. Well, and that's the thing, right? If you're going to compete, like if if Andrew Vaughn really is the Paul Canerico of this team, okay, and if he's got that kind of locker room gravitas. And that's that's one of the things that, that you're banking on with this guy. That's great, okay? But think about guys that have had that. It doesn't mean much if they don't produce in the long term, especially at a premium position where they should be hitting, like you said. You know, he should be a 30 home run guy at a minimum. At a minimum, and he should be hitting doubles off the wall constantly. And he should be he should be getting on base at a at a regular clip. I mean, again. His OPS should not start with a seven if he's going to play first base. It's just not acceptable. No. All right. I mean, if he was a skill position player and it's turning great double plays up the middle, you know, if he was a center fielder that could run like the wind, okay, fine. I could justify the fact that he's, you know, he's basically a league average to slightly, slightly above league average in terms of his OPS. But a, a corner infielder, especially first base, where your job is to guard the line. Understand the idea of when the move in, when the guy might bunt. You know, know when the pitcher should be covering and when you're covering, and and just you know stand there and catch the thing when it's thrown at you and pick it every once in a while. You got to be able to hit. Maybe it's because of the fact that I have I have spent the majority of my life looking over at first base for the White Sox and seeing really good hitters. Oh, it, it, it hasn't it been? Maybe that's the problem, right? Like Green Bay always has good quarterbacks, and the White Sox have always had really good first basemen. Except for like right now, this guy does not hit the ball like the first baseman that I have watched for the majority of my time with the White Sox. But then all I have to do is just bring up the stats of every first baseman in baseball, and I can see that he's in the bottom. Like if you just well, you know just just oh, list yeah. just list every first baseman in, in Major League Baseball and put their numbers up there, and he's not he's not even in the top half. No, he doesn't factor in in any way, shape, or form there. I mean, it's it's just, you know. It's going to be his year 26 season, right? Like, a lot of guys hit their prime 26, 27 years old, right? So he's got a chance to make that jump. But if at 26 years old I see the same thing, then, you know, in the offseason next year, I'm going to be like, and what are we doing at first base? Because this guy ain't the answer. No, and, and you're going to be able to get guys very, very easily because they are out there and they will be free agents. And Andrew Vaughn, you're on the clock, man. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always on SocksInTheBasement.com.